So I'm here to talk about global entertainment and our shrinking planet because I, hopefully like you, are sick and tired of the fact that Hollywood really creates and holds on to everything and then feeds that stuff to us <laughs> in a way that we sort of have to accept it. And I'm here to say that I think those, those days are, are over. We're, we're entering into a new realm of entertainment and that the, the day of holding on to that is, is very different. Now, in the, when I first started in the movie business, I was working for George Lucas at Lucasfilm and, and he wound up uh, starting a group that you've probably heard of called Pixar. Um, and the reason he started that group was because George was incredibly um, shy. He hated dealing with other people. And the concept of the Pixar was to create a device where he could actually direct humans and, and put locations together and composite them where he didn't have to interact with people, which is sort of the anathema of what communication should be about. It should be about interacting with people. It should be about moving people. And if you're shy and strange and whatnot, then just watch the computer screen. So the early storytelling started around the campfire. Um, people would sit around, and, and, and we would pass a stick. They, I wouldn't. I wasn't there. They would pass a <laughs> stick, and, and um, people would talk, and, and they'd have uh, uh, fables that they would tell, scary stories that they would tell, communications from the past, stories from their ancestors. Um, and it was, it was oftentimes the people that were the best storytellers that wound up getting the stick. And I guess that was the beginning of our actors, you know. Um, and then later on, there was this new technology that came to bear. And the new technology was rocks, right? And so people started using rock art. And they started making cave paintings. And, and now it sort of removed that storytelling capability out of the hands of everyone. It became less democratized. And even in that early, those early days, much more specialized. It was the rock art people that did very, very well, and your, your, your cave painters that did very, very well. Which reminds me of a cartoon I saw was um, there's uh, two guys and they're sitting in a cave and one guy's got a bow and arrow and, and the other guy's painting you know, cave art and the, the title underneath he says, he says, okay, enough with the storyboards. Can we go out and shoot something? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, and as we, as we move forward with, with um, art and communication, we move into painting. And then the famous Gutenberg days, where all of a sudden printing and publishing became available. We were able to distribute things much more easily. Um, and then there was theater. And, and, uh, and, and theater came of age at its time and, and still has, has stays, stayed with us, though significantly less import, important and significantly less politically impactful as it was at the time that it was developed. Um, and then the magic box was, was discovered, was invented, uh, photography. And then all of a sudden things start to change very, very quickly. Electronic communication starts to take place. And we have <coughs> film and radio and ultimately television. And then the big, the big bang happens. Mm -hmm. And the big bang for me was the internet and digital media. Now, when that happened, the entire game changed, or started to change. Because back in the day, as we look at what the technology and infrastructure was around those specific pieces of communication, we had, I don't know if you could read it, you know, in a campfire, all you needed was your vocal cords and wood and fire, right? And we moved to cave painting, and it was now rocks and pigments and caves, and then to painting with canvases, brushes, pigment paint in museums to now show it, uh, publishing paper, ink printing prices, stores, and the post office, the ability to be able to move things around in a postal service. Theater, which now we brought in actors and sets and lights and costumes, and then ultimately had to build theaters to, to show this. Again, people started to see more and more of it, but it was still limited in terms of the audience and becoming much more structured and much more limiting in terms of who the artist was and the capability that the artist had was and the tools that the artist could have at his or her disposal to be able to create that art. 
And then it moves into photography, and now things start getting even more expensive. There's film and camera and lenses and paper and chemicals, and the, the advent of publishing takes hold and also, and, and, and there's photographic books and displays and museums. And then finally it moves, from my generation, moves into, into movies where there are now everything comes to play. And in fact, in many reasons, uh, for many reasons, that's the reason why I got involved in the film business. I, I had been involved in the music business uh, for a period of time in the late 60s and early 70s. And then I was involved in the video business in the 70s and 80s. No, it's not that video business. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and ultimately got involved in the film business because my passion was to be able to put myself in an environment where we had as many tools as we possibly could have to be able to shape people's minds and allow them to be able to mo be moved, as, as Leslie was saying, to be moved emotionally so that uh, the, the result of the experience is when you walk out of that theater or you uh, turn off that TV, you've learned something about yourself and or you've learned and been to some place that is fantastic and ultimately has changed you and shaped you into, in my hope, a better human being. Um, and then my career changed because I started to think about the projects that I was involved with and was it actually doing that, you know? Um, I like to say that I've been involved with uh, some of the best parts of some of the worst movies. <laughs> so the number of explosions that have taken place, beheadings that have taken place, you know, finally I had enough when Transformers came out, I said, okay, I can't take this anymore. I, I have to get out of this business. Um, and so where does it go there? The exclusivity and the control and the costs of doing this kind of work just continued to escalate. Um, we, we were seeing things like motion control rigs that were costing $100,000 to $150,000. We were seeing uh, cameras that were, uh, where just the glass alone, the lenses alone were $100,000. So the ability to be able to now create something uh, was extraordinarily expensive. I remember I was interviewing Marty Scorsese a couple of months ago, and we were talking about the advent of the new digital camera. And he was saying the only problem with the digital camera is that the lenses are so darn expensive. But he recalled back in the day when he first started shooting where, you know, it was studio cameras. And it wasn't that long ago. When you think about it, people were not shooting on location, even with 16 millimeter handheld cameras, when Marty first started working in the movie industry in the late 50s, early 60s. You had to have a studio camera, those big Mitchell BNC cameras. And to be able to shoot that kind of film was, you had to be part of the studio system. There was no other way around it. You could not finance a, a, a motion picture, a film, uh, with, with an average budget. And then 16 millimeter cameras came in and handheld cameras came in and the, the cost started to go down, but still relatively expensive. Photochemical process, film editing, sound, not, and not to mention visual effects, which is now the, the, really the thing that drives box office. But with digital media, digital media was really starting to pull back. I mean, it seems very, very complex, but it was m removing the cost of being able to create high quality images and ultimately tell really world class stories without the need for the kinds of budgets that Jim Cameron had. Um, Really, all you needed was software and hardware, and your distribution system became the internet. We look at two cameras here. One is a, you know, a, a 5D, a Canon 5D, and the other is a GoPro. I think the prices on them somewhere is you know, $3,500 with a lens on top, and a GoPro is probably $350 and can go anywhere. The ability to to access digital images now at a very high level of quality is relatively inexpensive and therefore available to many people and we're now seeing this, the democratization of being able to tell, uh, tell stories using motion picture images. Whoops. In the digital intermediate, which before you needed an, uh, a post-production studio, uh, uh, an editor, a sound mixing studio, a sound stage, um, Foley artists, 
um, any number of people to create the editing process that allows us to create high quality movies. Um, I've worked at Skywalker Sound and Industrial Like and Magic and Digital Domain and the infrastructure necessary to be able to create that stuff is extraordinary. Uh, recently a friend of mine's company went out of business, I didn't go out of business, went bankrupt. Rhythm and Hughes is a company that's been around for 25 years but they couldn't even support the massive amount of equipment and infrastructure given today's economy and the way in which movies are being made. And we're seeing a lot of visual <coughs> effects companies and post-production companies winding up going out of business for a multitude of reasons, but one of which is now the cost of entry is significantly lower than it was back in the day. For example, when I started Digital Domain, we bought a whopping amount of, um, of hard disk uh, uh, available to the studio. I think we spent about $750,000, three quarters of a million dollars of putting hard drive arrays uh, within the studio, and I believe the amount was 3.2 terabytes. So if you think about that today, um, you could go down to your lo local radio shack with your credit card and be able to buy significantly more storage than we bought for three quarters of a million dollars. So Moore's Law does exist, it does work, and it will continue to be able to change the way in which stories are told because technology becomes significantly cheaper. So the old world, di distribution is critical because um, as opposed to, I think, the way a lot of people outside of the movie industry think, it's distribu distributors are the one that control the finance and ultimately make the money. And um, what they don't do, which is, I think, oftentimes overlooked, is they don't create the creative. So when, let's say, the Japanese came in in the 1990s in acquiring studios in the United States, their hope was that they were going to be able to acquire creative companies that actually create movies. Contrary to what they believe, no, 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 the people in the Black Tower at Universal do not make movies. It's the producers and the directors and the creative community that creates movies, but what the studios do is they distribute, they make the money, and therefore they finance them. Nowadays, it's changed a little bit. They're not financing. They figured out a way not to just finance them themselves. What they've actually figured out a way to do is to use other people's money to finance their movies, but allow them to be in first position when things are paid back. It, it's almost like religion, right? <laughs> Where you, you go to church and, and the pe pr uh, pastor, priest, or rabbi says to you, well, I don't know if I could fix you right now. But if you give me money, after you die, you will go to heaven. <laughs> I love that business model. <laughs> and there's no taxes. <laughs> so the old world distributors of 20th Century Fox and Disney and Universal, which has really had a stranglehold on this business for a very, very long time, um, things are changing. And they think they understand the change, and they think that they're going to be able to weather the change, um, just like the railroad industry did when the car came out. And, and they're just not, for so many reasons, right? But there's going to be a new group of distributors and a new group of financiers, and that's going to be these kinds of folks, right? Now, A, they have the money. B, they have a need, and C, we don't need Charlie in a truck with a bunch of celluloid driving around to movie theaters and delivering reels of film. Since distribution will be digital, and it already is to an extent, the smokestack distributors will start to go away, and the new world distributors will start to take their place. Now there's another need out there too, which are, gonna, which are smart devices. Nowadays, between smartphones and smart TVs, um, the ability to be able to pull down content from the World Wide Web, the digital distri distribution network, um, is, is really important to people that make those devices. So at some point, why would you buy, let's say, an LG big screen TV 
over, let's say, a Samsung big screen TV or a Sony big screen TV. Well, they'll try to get you on, on, on sort of, it looks better, it's got better refresh rate, but the truth of the matter is they all look pretty damn good, right? <laughs> And so then it's a matter of features. You know, we're able to do this, we're able to do that. And then it's a matter of price. Well, we know what being in the price mode does. It's just a swim to the bottom because ultimately people will just keep cutting prices. It'll get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And even Michael Dell won't be able to make a penny. So what is it that these people are going to need? And my sense is what they're going to need is they're going to need proprietary um, content. So that if you go to an Apple TV or you go to a Samsung TV, Samsung will wind up financing the content creators. Now remember, the content creators are men and women, probably a lot like you. They're not people stuck in the black tower. So this starts to open up possibilities that are out unbelievable. What was, until this time, a closed door country club community within Hollywood is now <coughs> starting to open up. So distributors, as well as smart device um, uh, providers, will be financing those movies. And guess what? They're not going to be able to play in the Hollywood model, because the people in the Hollywood model get paid in a way that these guys don't understand. So for example, if you're J.J. Abrams, and you're making, I don't know how much money Kathy Kennedy paid him to direct Star, Star Wars, but you're making outrageous amounts of money. Well, Silicon Valley doesn't understand that concept. The way they understand making a lot of money is by actually having success. In Hollywood, <laughs> it, it's really strange. In Hollywood, that's not the model. The model in Hollywood is what your past successes have been. And if you've sh are driven box office in the past, even if your past successes are not that great, you have the ability to, to demand upfront money that's extraordinary. And why do you demand the upfront money that's extraordinary? Because <coughs> Hollywood, the broken model, has actually made you do it. Who, who remembers the, the Art Buckwaldian concept of economics in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. In the mid-1980s, a fellow by the name of Art Buckwald said, you know, I think you're hiding money. I don't know, I may be stupid, but I don't think you're telling the truth. And so they went in, they did a whole bunch of forensic accounting within the studios only to find out that Art was right. Art was really right. So much so that when the studio is able to do their accounting, they do everything they possibly can to show that they don't make money. I happened to be involved in a movie that was the second largest movie of all time, and uh, at the time was the first largest movie of all time, and I was able to negotiate two adjusted gross points in the movie. That's back-end participation in a motion picture. Now, generally, back-end participation in a motion picture um, doesn't really amount to much, and the reason it doesn't amount to much is A, it's not a mega hit, or B, the studio hides the money, so it looks like it's not making any money. Well, at the time that I brought this effort to the studio and said, now wait a second, I have adjusted gross points in this film, and you're showing me your P&L statements, and you're not making any money, the box office on Titanic was 1.9 billion, not million, billion dollars. They still were not making any money. I think Art was really, really right. <laughs> now there's a new thing that's going to happen. We could call it augmented reality or altered reality. But with these smart devices, and uh, my friend Alex Henry was showing me one before, with these smart devices, there's this new capability to be able to create images by looking through let's say, an existing device. So if I hold up my iPad, I look through my iPad, I'm able to see the room just as it is now. But in addition to seeing the room, a monster just broke through that back wall and is coming to forward to attack me. It's pretty close. That capability is pretty close. I, I don't know if you've seen it. Google just announced their Google lenses that you're going to be able to buy if you're in a queue and you write a nice letter. Um, for $1,500, dollars 
I'm working with a company right now that's developing those virtual reality-based lenses as well, as well as a, a power pack to be able to stream from the internet while you're walking around. So the ability to have a heads-up display and see augmented reality. But in this case, again, uh, um, images brought to you by artists and people that work in the industry. So it's not like what YouTube first looked like when it came out, where every Tom, Dick, and Jane was able to put something of their kid picking their nose. They are actually uh, are looking at creating uh, environments and stories uh, that will take place in, the, in this new world. Uh, for example, one of the things that they're looking at is the possibility of having rooms or arenas that you could go visit with some of your favorite rock bands, where you'll actually be able to walk in and see the Beatles perform. <laughs> So these are some of the storyboards that this company has been putting together, and they're probably nine months away from delivering product. Again, uh, being able to look out into a world where there, are, where there is a mountain and trees, and all of a sudden the creature breaks through the mountain. And being able to go, let's say this is where the Rolling Stones are going to play. You're able to fly into where they're going to play and now be able to participate and see other people in that environment, like um, uh, uh, role-playing games, and be able to see people in that other environment and listen to the new Rolling Stones record, assuming they're still alive. And they don't, actually, they don't have to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> now, the world is changing. When I first started in the movie industry, the world was um, all about, really, in a lot of ways, about domestic box office. It was actually called um, US box office and um, worldwide box office. But nowadays, if you look at the top, and I'll show you the top 20. I couldn't fit them all on one slide. But if you look at the top 20 films of all time, the amount of international box office is far exceeds the amount of domestic or US box office. Now, these are the biggest movies of all time. I have a feeling if we look at travel, uh, 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 my travels with Miss Daisy, what's it called? Driving Miss Daisy. Driving Miss Daisy. That, in fact, you would not see these kinds of numbers because people in Sri Lanka and Kuala Lumpur probably don't understand the concept of driving with Miss, driving Miss Daisy. But the films that are coming out nowadays, the blockbuster films that Hollywood is making, uh, really play in a very big way in an international basis. And so, interestingly enough, most of them are visual effects movies. And the reason why they are visual effects movies is because uh, the, the subtleties of dialogue or the, or the subtleties of culture, uh, of, com of comedy, are culture-based, right? But the, if you see a, a city <coughs> torn down by a hurricane or a tornado, everybody gets that around the world. So these are the kinds of films that are going to continue to be made. Uh, the, I have them broken down for another talk that I gave, which was, all of the ones in yellow had major movie stars, and all of the ones in green were animated, um, and all of the ones in blue are visual effects movies. So the interesting part is that back in old Hollywood, old Hollywood thought that movie stars was, were critical to the success of a movie. Um, all we have to do is look at some of the movies in the last 10 years that had big movie stars in them, and they did terribly. In fact, most of these movies do not have movie stars in it. I, I contend that the movie stars in these movies are the men and women that create the visual effects that get you to go to the theater. Um, and interestingly enough, the ones that are, um, that are in yellow, there's only one movie star, which would be Johnny Depp. Yeah. <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? Yeah. Oh, the Avengers. I take it back. So we've seen various industries in the United States go away and become global. And, and most often, those industries go away because of the hubris of the American business sensibility, the hubris of Wall Street, the hubris of the 1% who believe that because we're American, we should be the best at whatever it is that we do. And um, that just obviously doesn't hold water. I, I talk to men and women today who are in the visual effects industry, and many of them say, well, but the Chinese don't quite get what we get. Not. 
They haven't yet done it to the level that you've done it, but if you turn the wheel two or three times, it's over. So the last great American industry, the movie industry, will no longer be American. And there are major players that are coming up right now. The Chinese, for example, that's Han Sam Ping, the head of the China Film Group, one of the most powerful film uh, groups in the world. I believe by the year 2020, uh, there will be a larger percentage of Chinese people going to the movie theater than any other nation in the world. They will surpass the United States. And um, they are building five new movie theaters every week. The numbers are mind-boggling. It's very difficult. But I, I have a discussion with somebody who told me that there are more millionaires in China than there are in the United States. Well, there are. That's because there are 1.7 billion people in China. And there's 200 million millionaires. The numbers are huge. Now, here's an interesting thing that's happening when we get back to the distributor. The distributor, uh, which I talked about it transitioning into the Googles and the YouTubes and the like, they're looking at the old studio system. And the old studio system back in the 30s and 40s and 50s was within Hollywood, those studios owned all of the content and owned all of the players and all of the directors and all of the writers. And it wasn't really until the 60s and 70s when that started to fall apart. And now you started to see the director as auteur or a, a, a very famous screenwriter that was able to move around from studio to studio because generally what happened is they had these people under contract. Well, right now these companies, YouTube and Maker, for example, are going back to the old studio system. And what they're doing is they're building out facilities allowing world-class computer technology, visual effects technology, sound editing, sound mixing, cameras, green stage, sound stages, all under the, uh, the auspices of Maker and YouTube, and that you as an individual, if you'd like to produce your work, we'll screen you to see if it's, if it's something we're interested in. And then if it's interested, we'll not only teach you how to use the equipment, we'll give you the equipment for free. Sounds pretty awesome, except we own it. So now you as an artist who've come up with this really great idea, and I don't understand why this is a great idea, but for some reason it gets 80 million hits on the internet, these <laughs> stupid frickin' talking oranges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you start to do the numbers on advertising on 80 million hits, these guys are making a fortune. And advertising is moving away from what was broadcast television and, and, and the like. And so now advertising is really moving towards the digital arts model. And so will YouTube and Maker become the next studios? And I contend that they will. Not only do I contend that they will, Paramount and some of the other studios agree. And that's why they're making major investments in, in Maker Studios. And with that, I thank you.